at the very first step the student takes into the hidden pathway of nature's mysteries, he is met face to face with this startling fact that all his preconceptions, all his education, all his accumulation of materialistic wisdom are unable to account for the most simple phenomena that transpire in the action and interaction of the life forces of the planet on which he lives. As a chemist, he may pursue the atoms of force until they become lost within the realms of the imponderable, the great unknown, or as it has been facetiously christened amid the groans of scientific travail, the aching void. But he can get no farther. As a physicist, he may decompose light and sound into their component parts, and with scientific accuracy dissect them before your very eyes, as a surgeon would his anatomical subject. But no sooner is this point reached than the shy molecules and timid vibrations become alarmed, as it were, at man's daring presumption and fly into the realm of the infinite unknown. There, in the aching void, to sport in delight, safe from man's intrusion. This realm of the unknown imponderables is the universal ether, an infinite ocean of something, which science created in her frantic endeavors to account for the material phenomena of light and heat, and for a time she was infinitely pleased with her own peculiar offspring. But it has become a restless phantom, a grim, unlovely specter, which haunts the laboratories of her parent night and day, until at last science has become frightened at her own child and tries now in vain to slay the ghost of her own creation. She dares not enter the aching void she has called into existence, and there pursue and recapture the truant atoms and timid vibrations of this sublunary sphere. Therefore, at the very outset of his pilgrimage, through these vast and as yet scientifically unknown regions, the student had better unload, so to say, all the heavy and useless baggage of educated opinion and scientific dogmas that he may have on board. If he does not, he will find himself top-heavy and will either capsize or run off the track and be buried amid the debris of conflicting opinions. The only equipment that will be found useful and will repay the cost of transportation is an unbiased mind, logical reasoning, genuine common sense, and a calm, reflective brain. Anything else for the voyage upon which we are now about to embark is simply so much useless, costly lumber. Hence, so far as modern science and theology are concerned, the less the student has, the better it is for him. Unless he can use his scientific acquirements merely as aids in climbing the spiritual steps of occultism. If he can do this, then he will find science a most valuable auxiliary aid. But this achievement is an exceedingly rare gift, and one that is seldom found. It is also a most delusive snare, because nine out of every ten seriously cheat themselves into the belief that they possess this ability, whereas in reality they are woefully deficient. Hence, it is always a safe course to mistrust the absolute impartiality of our opinions and reasoning. 
Before starting out on such a mighty and important undertaking, we must draw the reader's attention to the chief obstacle of the voyage, and the one which he will have the greatest difficulty in surmounting. This hidden rock upon which so many otherwise profound students of the occult have become shipwrecked is the non-realization of the duality of truth the truth of appearances, and the truth of realities. The former is relative only, but the latter is absolute. We do not mean merely taking for granted that truth is dual, and so assenting to the statement, but we mean that the great majority of occult students fail to realize this conception within themselves. Know that everything is real upon its plane of manifestation. If we possess half of anything, we know by the laws of common sense and logical reasoning that there is another half somewhere. No subtle twist of metaphysical sophistry can cheat us into the belief that we possess the whole when we know and see that we have just exactly half and no more. Further, when we look at any known thing, and we know that to possess the attributes of a thing, it must possess three dimensions, length, breadth, and thickness. This being so, we also know that it has, broadly speaking, two sides an outside, and an inside. The outside is not the inside, any more than the boiler is the steam which drives the engine. This logical process of reasoning is the only chart that has so far been prepared for the occult explorer. It is vague and probably very unsatisfactory, so far as details are concerned. But when used in conjunction with conscious intuition, the only true compass man has by which to guide himself in his winding, uneven path upon the shores of the infinite. He never need fear being lost or failing in his endeavors to know the truth. In order to carry out the same line of reasoning a little further, Let us take a type of architecture, say the Gothic, and mentally examine some well-known, handsome specimen of this structural conception. The world's thought will say, What a beautiful building! How imposing and grand! What a triumph of man's mechanical skill! So it appears to the world, and upon the plane of appearances, so it really is. Consequently, it is a truth for the time being, but when examined by the light of occult science, we find this truth is relative only, that it is only true upon the external, transitory plane of material phenomena. We see that, in addition to being the result of man's trained mechanical ability, it is also the external form of his mental ideal. It is, in fact, the phenomenal outcome of his creative attributes. When we look at the solid building from the earth's plane, we see only the outside of a thing having length, breadth, and thickness. Now, since we know that there must be an inside, we must enter the interior plane before we can see it and therein we shall find that it exists within the subjective world of its architect. The solid stone edifice will in time crumble to decay, fall, and finally not one material atom will remain to indicate the place whereon it stood. Hence, it is not permanently real. It is only a passing appearance 
assumed by matter, under the molding forces of man's mechanical ability, as soon as the forces which gave it form become polarized by the restless oceans of planetary magnetism, it will dissolve and finally vanish like the baseless fabric of a dream. But though the external structure of stone and mortar is lost within the soil of the earth, the idea which created it is eternal because it was a spiritual reality. Therefore, we see that the absolute truth, the eternal reality, appears to be the non-reality upon the plane of matter, while the material structure appears to be the only thing which is real. It is these delusive appearances that have created the almost hopeless confusion regarding the exact meaning of the terms spirit and matter. Science refers all she cannot grapple with to some of the undiscovered forces of matter, while theology refers all that she cannot explain to the unknowable workings of the spirit. Both are right and both are wrong. And as we shall have to explore the territory belonging to both of these terms during the progress of our journey, we will in this place briefly add that spirit and matter as we know them are but the dual expression of the one deific principle due to the differences of polarity. In other words, a unity under two modes of action. This duality can only be comprehended in its true relationship when viewed from both planes and realized by the science of correspondences, which science is but a material system of symbolism from which we can justly regulate our conceptions of all things. Plato once said, ideas rule the world. So far, Plato was right, for before the divine idea was evolved from within the divine sensorium of the infinite one, the universe was not. Hence the result of the divine idea was the evolution of a pure symbolic form. Just as symbols are the product of ideas, so in their turn, ideas are the symbols of thought, and thought itself is but the symbolic response of the ego to the pulsating throb of the deific will, the divine radiant soul of the infinite one. Back of this, we cannot penetrate, even in our most exalted conceptions. Hence, all serious study and meditation as to the nature and existence of God is unprofitable and cannot bring the student any substantial return, either in this world or the next. Seeing that the infinite can never be comprehended by the finite, therefore we must rest satisfied with the certain knowledge that we can by one grand chain of sequences trace the transmission of thoughts, ideas, and symbolic forms to their source. Thus the angelic world is but a prototype or symbolic expression of the divine sphere of the infinite. The celestial world is a reflection of the angelic world. The spiritual world is a prototype and symbolic outcome of the celestial heavens. The astral world is the reflection of the spiritual sphere. And lastly, the material, our world, is but the concrete shadow of the astral kingdoms. Hence, the reader can perceive that we, in our present state, are a long way down in the scale of creative life. But, if we are, we know by the laws of our being that we can and shall 
win our way back through this valley of the shadow, this plain of inverted images and delusive appearances, into the bright realms of our former state, those spheres of pure angelic life where alone exist the ever-living reels of all the infinitude of apparent realities. <laughs>